I invite you at this time to turn in your Bibles to page 840 if you're in the ESV, the Dark Bibles in front of you. If you're following in the Following Jesus Bible, it'll be in page 1150. We continue our series in the Gospel according to John, the Good News according to John. And we've called this series Cruciform Power as we're looking at this idea of how do we use the power that God has given us in this, this world. And we're saying that the power that Christ demonstrated um, for us to imitate is a cruciform kind of power, a power that leads to the cross, a kind of power that submits to the lordship of, of, of Christ. And it's an it's a upside-down kind of power in many ways to the power of this world, a power this world is largely a dominating over one another, a manipulative kind of power or a coercive kind of power. And the power of Christ is an invita- invitational kind of power. All right? So we're deep into this now, and so we're starting to see some themes uh, emerge. In fact, what Colleen talked about in the last two songs is what the Feast of Tabernacles is largely about. It was a water festival in many kind of ways, and we talked about that last week. Don't have time to get into all this, but a significant thing they did was go down to the Pool of Siloam and bring water up to the altar and pour that out. And at the last day, the great day of the feast, we talked about this last week, Jesus says, I am that living, or um, come to me and you'll receive that living water. All right? And that referred back into the Exodus when we looked in the Old Testament where the Israelites were out in the desert. They had no water and they got water from the rock that Moses struck. And out of that rock came living water. And we said, Jesus is the rock from whence this living water comes forward. And we said that the living water is not Christ, it's the Holy Spirit. And John, above all other the Gospels, speaks profoundly to the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives and in what it means to be a a disciple and how Jesus and the Holy Spirit are linked very, very closely together. All right, so that's where we're at. We're still in the Feast of Tabernacles, but we're at an interesting place here. Um, there's going to be an asterisk before we start the next verse in uh, chapter 7, verse 53. And you'll see in your Bibles there, if you got it out and you're already looking at it, that it's going to be in parentheses. There's going to be an asterisk there. And if you look and follow that, you're going to see this text is not in the vast majority of of the early manuscripts that we have of the Bible. It's just, it's not there. All right, but there, it's found in some. It's found more in the Latin. The Greek, it's almost non-existent. Augustine had it. Jerome had it, from which the, the Vulgate, the Latin Bible came forth, and what the King James was based on, it had it there too. So most of the commentators, and I agree with this, it, it really doesn't, it wasn't here necessarily from the very beginning. Now, it could have been. But it could have been inserted in there as well. You can read from verse 52 and jump right to verse 12, and it reads seamlessly. All right? And some of the phrases and words in this text are not part of John's vocabulary. He just does not use these phrases. They're found in Luke and Matthew and other places, but not John. They're just exclusive to this. So there's a lot of evidence that this text was probably added in um, fairly early on. But there's no doubt that this happened. There's not a single commentator that I know that does not believe that this did not happen. This story was part of the Christian story from very early on, and rightfully so. It's a powerful story of what Jesus did. All right. So, a little discourse there, why you see that in here. It's in our ESV Bible, and I think rightfully so, because it's a powerful, powerful story of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But just to understand some of the canonical ways of how the Bible comes, it's quite complicated and difficult. But we trust that our God is a sovereign God. He knows how to pull this all together. We can trust that the Bible is authoritative and infallible in all of what it has to say. All right, so if you have any questions about that, you can, you can see me afterwards. But here's, here's the text, and that's why the asterisk is there. I'm going to go ahead and, and read, and then we'll pray, and we'll dive into this phenomenal story in chapter 8. They went each to his own house, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. 
Early in the morning he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such woman. So what do you say? This they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with a woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. Heavenly Father and Lord Jesus Christ, especially Holy Spirit, as we take a look at these inspired words by you, may we be open for the good work that you'd want to do in our lives. And again, to shape us more and more into the image of your son, Jesus. This is his name that we pray this. Amen. If the teachings of Jesus were a lake, this is one of the places we can see almost all the way to the bottom. All right, this this is a picture of Lake Tahoe. We are blessed to have Lake Tahoe in our backyard. And if you've been out on this lake like I have many, many times, it's amazing the clarity of the water. In previous times, you can see over 100 feet down to the bottom. Now it's closer to about 70 feet or, or so. It looks like that boat is floating in air almost, if it wasn't for some of the ripples and the sun shining right, right there. This text is one of the clearest texts that allows us to understand the heart of Jesus, where he is coming from. Now, I submit to you that this text is also one of the clearest connecting texts to a story that we are already very familiar with here at Cornerstone, the story of the two lost sons. And most of you know, who are part of Cornerstone, that I love this story. This story is one of, I think, the the clearest ways and best ways to be able to understand the good news of Jesus and the whole idea of how God understands salvation is all wrapped up in the story. And then Rembrandt captured this story in this painting. It is by far my most favorite painting in this entire world. It's called The Prodigal Son, but as I mentioned, it's better called The Two Lost Sons. Because the scripture's clear, and the way it's written there, both the younger son and the elder son are lost. If you're not familiar with that story, it's in Luke 15. I invite you to, to read that at some time. But basically, a father had two sons that were going to gain inheritance from him. The younger son dissed his dad, basically, and said, I want my inheritance now while you're still alive, which was the greatest dishonor you can possibly do to your dad. So he took his inheritance and left and squandered it in wild, hedonistic kind of living. And when he was all out of his inheritance, he found himself slopping with the pigs. He said, what have I got myself into? And realized, well, maybe this is not the best life after all. And maybe I was not right in doing this. And he finds humility and plans to go back and repent to the Father. And he does. But amazingly, the father doesn't wait for the son to come back. He runs out and embraces him and welcomes him back and throws a giant party because the son that was once lost now is found again. And the elder brother is not having any of this. He's upset because he's, he thinks he's earning the father's favor, yet he's never gotten a party or a celebration. And God, or the father says to him, well, all this has always been yours. 
And the elder son thought he was working for it and earning it. And the story is that they're both lost. They both need God's grace. They both need to repent. And I submit to you that this story here, that the woman is the younger woman or the younger son, the prodigal son in some ways. And the scribes and the Pharisees are the elder brother here. We've seen in John and other places, there's only two kinds of people in this world, believers and unbelievers. Disciples of Christ and non-disciples of Christ. But there's two types of unbelievers. Elder brother unbelievers or younger brother unbelievers. One is irreligious, kind of doing their own thing, not caught up in church and the, the things that we do here, gathering together, sermons, sacrament, none of that stuff. But they'll still say they believe in God. Maybe even say that they believe that Jesus died for their sins and they're going to go to heaven someday. But I'm just still going to live my life as I largely please because God is a good and gracious God, a merciful God. He's going to forgive me anyways of all my sins so I can go live the life that I want, not on His terms. All right? So this is the, the younger son here. The elder son, in his lostness, seeks through religion, to earn God's favor. And we're taught over and over again, we're saved by grace through faith. And it's not something that we can earn. It's a gift that God gives us. So he's lost too. All right. So we're going to see the heart of Jesus here. And it's good news, but we're also going to see some of the gentleness of Jesus, how he approaches this really hostile kind of situation. And Jesus doesn't get hostile back. He responds both to the woman, and to the scribes and Pharisees in mind-blowing simplicity and gentleness. And it's absolutely amazing. Now, look closely at the prodigal son picture here. If you have time to do this, I invite you to do this as as well. You can go online and get a high-quality picture and look at it. But this is the prodigal son. This is blown up. This is the brilliance of Rembrandt and bringing in the nuances of the gospel of Christ, of salvation, if you will, the bigger picture of sal- salvation. All right. Do you notice anything different about the hands? They don't look the same, do they? When you take a closer look, they are two different hands, if you will, and that's intentional. The left hand is a much bigger, dominant hand on the right shoulder of the prodigal son, a place of authority and strength. The right hand is placed more gently in the center of the back, the heart of the person, and tenderness and gentleness. It's brilliant. What he's painting here with this simple little picture is that with the right hand, he's painting the Father and salvation as something that we're saved from. It's about mercy, it's about grace, and it's tender. And we're saved from something. But we're also saved to something. He's not just Savior from something. He's Lord to something. And this is the hand of authority on the right shoulder of the prodigal son. That the work's not done, in a sense. That now there's a life to live in obedience Okay, so this is essential. If we understand this, you'll be able to uh, really see and interpret almost every passage in Scripture through this gospel salvation kind of lens. Let's walk through this. Um, Well, let me say say this. This is the heart of of Christ. Sorry about this. I already said this, but let me um, connect this with Scripture so you see that it's not just me saying this. In the one passage where Jesus speaks about his heart, there's only one. We get one insight into the heart of Christ from Christ Himself, and this is it. He says, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. It's mind-boggling. The Creator of the universe depicts Himself as gentle and lowly. That ought to shock us in many kinds of, of ways. Because we're going to see this. We need a gentle and lowly Savior who's going to stoop down 
us. I think I just... All right, we're back. To stoop down to save us. We don't need a harsh Savior. We need a gentle and lowly one. We're going to see this even more clearly in this, this story. And I lost that too. Boy, everything's going down. I'll need you to advance for, for me here. Please. So the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. So what we have going on here is a setup. This is a, a setup that's going on, on here. John's already made it known that the, the leaders of the, the Jews are out to trap Jesus, out to find something that they condemn him with, to put him to death, to put him to prison. All right? So they're setting up this scene here. They bring this woman to Jesus in the midst of the temple courts. There's a crowd around and people are listening and it's meant so that the public would see Jesus being caught here. Now this is a, a brilliant little setup by the scribes and Pharisees because Jesus was, from their eyes, in a no-win kind of situation. Now I read probably five different ways to interpret this no-win situation. I think the most plausible one is that he was going to go against Roman law or Jewish law one way or the other, and either way he was going to get trapped with this. All right, because they're right in the sense of saying that she needs to be stoned. So if he goes with that capital offense and saying she needs to be killed, needs to be stoned, well, he's going against Roman law. Because Roman law, which is over the Jewish folks there, they're under Roman occupation, said you can't put anybody to death. That is the prerogative of the Roman government. So if you say she needs to be stoned and we ought to do that because the law of Moses is that, well, now you're going to go against Roman law and then you're going to get thrown into jail there. And if he says, no, she doesn't need to be stoned or killed, well, now you're against the law of Moses, now you're against Jewish law. Either way, he's trapped and stuck in this and the Jews think that now they have him. All right? So this is the brilliance of Jesus and how he responds to us. Next slide here. This they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. And then Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And so right there, we, we see that this is a test. This is a setup that's going on here. But I want you to notice some of the posture here. John, all the details here are vitally important. When we start seeing the repetition of bending down and standing up, he's, he's drawn our attention to the posture of Christ. Jesus stoops and bends down into the dirt before a woman. Now, no male Jew ever did that. It was a, they would never do that because that would show the authority of the woman over the male to have the woman stand over the male. That's exactly what's happening here. It's a sign of humility that's going on. Into the dirt. Now, the word for humility is the word for dirt as well. And so we're seeing Jesus bend down, go into the, into the ground, and, and, and write. Now, I'll just say, we don't know what he wrote. It's not there. So it's all speculation. So quickly, I can speculate as, as well. There's only two other places in Scripture where the hand of God writes. Jesus is God, right? This is what John clearly laid out prior to this. There's only two other places. You know those two places are? The first is with the Ten Commandments. The first of the Ten Commandments. He wrote that with his own hand. His own fingers scribbled that out and handed it to Moses. Anybody know what the second one is? Mm, exactly. Exactly. With Nebuchadnezzar. There's this banquet hall, and all of a sudden there's this human hand that appears out of nowhere and begins writing on the wall. And Nebuchadnezzar freaks out. It says his knees are, are knocking against one another. I'll tell you what, if a hand appeared on one of these walls and started writing on there, my knees might knock a little bit too. This is a crazy situation. But the hand of God's writing there, mene, mene, 
tekel tarsus is written there. Anybody know what that means? Mene um, means that your time has come to an end. Your rule has come to an end. And it says that twice. He's saying that to, to Nebuchadnezzar. The tekel means that you've been weighed and found wanting. You lack. You are not sufficient in yourself, nor is this kingdom. It is insufficient. And Parsis, and I'm drawing a blank off the top of my head right now. Parsis is something to do with, somebody have it there? Yeah. Anyways, those two are, are enough to, to have there. So both of those cases, you have the law of God, and then you have God speaking about the insufficiency of Nebuchadnezzar and his, his kingdom. It could have been something in those lines that he was writing down in Scripture, that the hand of God, once again, was writing. The law, do not covet. And we'll talk about that here in just a moment. Or maybe, do not commit adultery. All right? Or maybe he's writing the many, many tekel purses and saying, Jews, you are insufficient in and of yourself. The kingdom of God is amongst you and you don't even know it. Your rule, this is coming to an end. I am the temple here. I am the presence of God here. All right, so I don't know. Maybe he wrote some of those, those things down. Next slide here. As they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Let him who is out the, without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at here. So Jesus does not get hostile with them. He, he doesn't get caught in their dilemma. He simply says, all right, if you want to condemn her, those of you who set this up, a conspiracy, mind you. Now think about the details of what this conspiracy. Adultery, at that time and this time too, is something that was is not easily discoverable. Right? This is often in secret. And you had to have two witnesses to confirm this. So two witnesses saw this happen. How does that happen? This is likely a setup. All right, they probably knew this woman might have been a woman of the night, easily provoked or tempted. They found a guy, a fall guy, to go tempt her. And then they watched. And Jesus is saying, yeah, right. You scribes and Pharisees are bringing her and judging her. You need to look at your own heart of what's going on here. You've broken all kinds of laws here. So you, without sin, cast the first stone. Before you condemn her, take a look inside. Know your own heart. And it's a call to us too, as Lauren was talking about, not to be quick to judge, but be quick to look at our own sinful, fallen heart. Because it creates humility within us and a posture of compassion toward another, knowing that they struggle like we struggle, maybe in different kinds of ways. And it brings the gentleness out. Because no longer are they condemning her. They walk away one by one, starting with the older. Because the older you get, the more you recognize how fallen you are because you're exposed to your sin more and more and more and more. When we're younger, we think the world of ourselves. When we get a little bit older, we're not so quick to go there anymore. Verses 8 through 9. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones, and Jesus was left alone with a woman standing before him. Okay, so here's the posture. He's in the dirt. She's standing above him. There's no one else here. That's a phenomenal scene of the Lord, Creator, Savior of the universe is, is bent before the woman in a posture of gentleness and of humility. Next slide. Jesus then stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. This is, this is phenomenal. Jesus, this is the holistic aspect and view of salvation going on here. 
The scribes and Pharisees who thought they were self-righteous and really did not need a Savior because they saw God as Lord and they were obeying the law, they thought, in Matthew, Jesus calls them out. You, you, you obey a lot about the law, but you don't obey justice and mercy and has said the kind of love toward one another, which is kind of the heart of the law. So yeah, there's this external obedience to the, to, to the law. They don't think they need a Savior. So Jesus says, guess what? You're a sinner. Go contemplate that. You need a Savior. I'm Him. Now, to her, it's a little bit different. She recognizes or should recognize a little bit easier that she's a sinner as well. And her um, emphasis that Jesus gives is the ending there, go and sin no more. She's going to receive mercy and grace, neither do I condemn you, but you need to turn your life around. You need to start following me. Go and sin no more. Next slide here. So this is the gospel. This is, this is salvation in a nutshell. All right, neither do I condemn you. This is to the prodigal son or the prodigal daughter here. My grace is sufficient for you. My gift for you is sufficient. Believe in me and follow me. And go and sin no more. Jesus Savior, Jesus as Lord. It's a whole package kind of thing. And that's what the good news of Christ for us. Next slide here. Elsewhere through Scripture, just to show this, this is Paul in Romans, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Even her, even the prodigal son, God's grace is sufficient. That's why He came, to die for sinners, just like that. And if we're thinking or sitting here, well, I'm not as bad as them. Well, now you're, you're, you're acting kind of like elder brothership a little bit. That you don't quite need the salvation that, that they do with this. God, by His grace and sovereignty, can say, no condemnation for you in Christ Jesus. It's a gift, and it's received by faith. Next slide here. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. So there's just black and white. Jesus justifies the ungodly, which we all are. We are all elder brothers or younger brothers. We all fall into the camp of the younger daughter or the scribes and Pharisees. That's our tendency. And even as followers of Christ, we tend to kind of fall back. We've called this a pendulum of lostness in the past. Even as followers, we can fall back in the tendency of the elders' brothers and judge one another and condemn one another or to go off and do our own thing and sow our own seeds and change Scripture to fit our own needs or to neglect Scripture to fit our, our own needs. So we're reminded that we are the ungodly that God justifies. And that we hear the words, next slide here, neither do I condemn you. Those are the most glorious words you can hear as a human being. Neither do I condemn you. Because we deserve condemning. Every one of us. It says, by grace, through faith, I do not condemn you. And go sin no more. Which means we're not going to be perfect. The idea is to bend your knee to the Lord and follow Him in obedience to what He has said and what he has done to conform ourselves more and more to the image of, of Christ. Uh, this is salvation. That we're saved from sin and death to the abundant life in Jesus Christ that we get to partake of now. This extraordinary, not ordinary life in and through the Holy Spirit in which we are caught up in a story far greater than ourselves. So I, I encourage us every morning to wake up into the bigger story and to remind us of the bigger story that we're in, the salvific story that we're in in Christ and the good news that is for us. And at the end of the day, to remind yourself of the bigger story that we find ourselves in and to keep reminding us of and keep preaching the gospel to ourselves over and over again because we are the ungodly. We are the younger daughter. We are the scribes and Pharisees. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful good news of salvation in and through Jesus Christ. That you justify the ungodly, not because we deserve it or earn it, but because of Jesus Christ, who lived the life that we could not, who died the death that we deserved, who was raised to life after life so that we might have life in him, who ascended to the right hand of you, God the Father, a place of authority that we might bend our knee to you and strive to follow you Monday through Sunday. It's in Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. As we come to the table of grace this morning to communion, we're reminded of the salvific story of Jesus Christ's great sacrifice for us, for us younger daughters and us scribes and Pharisees, us legalists and licentious folks, that we all need the mercy and the grace of God. And that's what, what we remember here. Not just past, but that he is present with us now in and through the Holy Spirit to help equip us and empower us to be his disciples today.